Hello, I'm Andre J, and today I'm going to talk to y'all about doing camera feedback with Hydra. Um, so, what I have here is a setup. I've got an external USB camera here, as you can probably see. I don't know, I'm not actually monitoring the video output, so I'm just going to guess you can see things. I set it up pretty okay. Um, and I've got it propped up on my laptop over here with a couple of books. Um, you can get a little... Excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, you can get tiny little tripods for these or little like phone mounter things or things you can actually like screw on which would probably be quite handy in the long run. Uh, I've never actually gotten one of those. <laughs> Um, and I usually just use like a stack of books um, to to center the camera while I'm doing things. Um, but yeah, it's a pretty simple setup and it allows you to do some pretty amazing stuff. Um, so right off the bat, you can see this thing I've got going on here. Um, I'll take this apart and then build build it. We'll build our way back up to this thing over the process of this hour. Um, but you can see that there's some pretty notable differences between this and like the sort of digital uh, frame buffer feedback we've been doing before. Um, the most sort of notable one, I would say, is just you get these really just like luscious like blobs that like uh, are occurring. And this is something you're really, you're really going to struggle to get in digital feedback. It's not impossible. Um, but it's by no means as easy as it is to do in this kind of a zone. And this is kind of like, um, yeah, one of like the, the perks of just working, like involving photons in your feedback chain. <laughs> Gotta get some photons happening. And if you're the kind of person who is really interested in like talking about analog versus digital things, um, there's, you know, nothing quite more like the most analog signal you can get is a photon, right? Um, well, I mean, I don't know. Smells are pretty analog, too, but we don't really, like, work in, like, smell art that often. I'm not really sure how smell feedback would work. Um, huh. That might be kind of an interesting thing to dig into if you're like a perfumier or something, uh, nasal-based feedback uh, situations. Hello, folks. Nice to see y'all here. Um, but yeah, so got this pretty nifty little oil sheeny thing happening over here. And um, I'm not going to explain what's happening right now. I'm going to slowly build our way back up to it. But let's just get down to the basics here so you can see up here um, I've got S0 init cam 0 so because I have two cameras on here I need to use the device ID in here to select which camera I want to be using if I select one you can see that's just this camera right here but because I have two cameras um, I have to select zero um, this isn't necessarily always going to be, the numbers won't always match up, and they won't always be the same for, for even on your own system. Um, it's just kind of like, it has to do sometimes with like the order that they are like um, loaded in, the drivers are loaded up. Um, I'm not really sure. It's, you know, I, I, I've, I've played around with this a lot, and it just seems to be like semi-random. So if you try this out with your own and you see that this isn't working, just change the number and the number back. But yeah, so this is just unprocessed camera screen feedback in Hydra. Um, and you'll notice something if you're playing around with this on your own. Um, most likely you will see some sort of weird stretching thing that is happening. And um, I took a moment earlier to try to like make sure that I wouldn't have that I would have like a pretty decent aspect ratio going on. Um, let me explain what aspect ratio means. So if I invert this, then we'll see the black dodge pop up. And it's getting a little stroby. Um, I'm going to slow down the strobing a bit by blending with the previous frame. And this is a pretty common way to like, so using the inversion is a pretty handy way to like 
double check and see if your aspect ratio is all right. So say if the aspect ratio is off in one direction or the other, um, the, the little, uh, the, the, this tunnel here, the feedback tunnel, it would get very, very distorted very, very quickly. It would squeeze in one direction or squeeze in the other direction. Um, so I usually use this. This is how I use, like generally speaking, whenever I'm trying to match a camera up with the screen, no matter what sort of situation I'm doing, if I'm using analog gear, if I'm using Hydra, if I'm using any kind of digital situation, I just turn on an inversion and I try to match things up pretty well. Um, of course, you notice I'm not actually going to match things up pretty well. The way I have this sitting is kind of like this, so it's pushed in a bit, um, but it's matched up like reasonably well enough so that it's going to like do like some pretty like continuous like blobby feedback things. I can actually move this back a bit, maybe you can see some more of the tunnel, tunnel happening. But yeah, you've definitely seen this kind of thing before if you've played around with the internal feedback in Hydra. And you just do an invert, you'll get a very perfect exact tunnel going back. And then I can sort of control a lot of the speed of things by using this blend over here. I'm going to turn off inversion right now. Oops. Oops. Perfectly good argument for why y'all should get an actual tripod and not just rest this thing in a pile of bullets. So we can speed things up and slow them up by playing around with this blend right here. So, let's turn it off and we go back to where we were at. It might get a little jumpy and strobey. So, the jumpiness and the strobiness is happening because the frame rate of the draw. The frame rate of like the, 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 the drawing function in Hydra is not really matched up perfectly with the, um, the shutter speed of this camera. So pretty much any USB camera you get is going to be most likely 30 frames per second if you didn't spend a lot of money on it, and maybe 60 frames per second if you spent a bunch. Uh, most likely the refresh rate of your monitor which is different from the draw rate of Hydra, is going to be around 60 hertz or so, which means 60 times per second. Um, to, I mean, if you do like certain kinds, if you're into certain kinds of things, maybe you have like a faster refresh rate, maybe you're doing 120, maybe you're doing something like off off the, the, the sexagismal uh, grid and like 75 hertz or 80 hertz, those aren't unheard of. But most likely, it's like uh, something divisible by like 30 most of the time. But the important thing here is not the refresh rate, but how many times that this uh, Hydra is actually drawing things. And the, the number of times that Hydra will draw, um, I'm not sure if we can get like a frame rate access to like the actual frame rate counter, but I'm, whenever you see this sort of like pulsing strobing like that, like you see how I move things and it kind of like uh, 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 stutters a bit, because that frame rate is not perfectly synced up with the frame rate of the camera. Um, but luckily, there's a really easy way to kind of smooth that out. Just blend it with the previous frame, like so. So we can use the easiness of the, the internal feedback in Hydra to like make this feedback work out pretty nicely. And then let's just take a look at what happens when we play around with some of the color, uh, the, the color space functions in Hydra with this feedback. Um, so right off the bat, something I think would probably be fun would be to saturate. So saturate, let's try saturate 1.5 and toss that into the mix. And there we can see we're starting to get some color zones happening. Um, I'm doing this on a MacBook, which has, I don't know, I think it has like a retina display or something. I'm not really positive. It might be... It might be pre-Retina era MacBook, but either way, it's got like a pretty, like, it's got a pretty nice and like shimmery, like, screen for doing camera feedback stuff off of, and like, sort of everything. I do this in video waves, I do this in VSync on here, I get like the same kind of like, it adds a nice, like, specularity to the whole thing. Uh, so different kinds of screens that you use, or if you plug this into an external monitor, so you've got like, 
a 1080p USB camera and you have a 1080p external monitor that you want to use, uh, you'll get totally different things like based on that. And another nice thing about using external monitors is you will also have the ability to go into their menus and do things like play around with the hue, play around with the saturation on there. Uh, if you like, uh, one of the most fun things to do with the uh, camera video feedback is to play around with sharpening things. Because one of the questions I get asked like the most often is how do you get all those like crazy little worms in your camera feedback? The short answer is just sharpening. If you can use uh, any sort of like monitor or processor that has a sharpen in it, um, that'll pretty much do the trick for you. A nice LCD screen and uh, a lot of the good like uh, consumer 90s and early knots uh, CRTs will have sharpening in them. Um, yeah, so we're saturating here. Um, but maybe I want to start playing around with some hue cycling. So, go over to hue. This one is not in the list of hydro functions, I don't think. So, kind of makes me wonder, like, what else is not in this list that is, like, pretty handy and useful. But I found this while looking at some other things, and I see if there's a hue. And if I just do hue, point zero one. Add some hue shifting into things. Oh, I need to correctly format my code. And that might not be quite enough. We can do a bit more than we could over in the internal zones. And here we go. Hello! Welcome everybody to the stream. So yeah, if you checked out my stream last week when I was playing around with video waves, you might recognize this exact sort of stuff. Um, so this is pretty much any kind of like digital digital processing, like USB camera feedback things. If you can jack up the saturation and add a tiny bit of hue offset, you will get hue cycling reaction diffusion. And yeah, it really is like we're getting we're getting the hue worms. So. Um, if you do the sharpening, you can get the, 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 the brightness worms, uh, but if you add just like enough hue shifting and saturation to your situations, then you can get these nice little hue worms happening. Let's see what happens when I push in a bit. Yeah. All right, now I've got this set up pretty nicely. Um, we can also play around with the contrast a bit. So, forget offhand what the range of contrast in, so I'm not even going to look, and I'm just going to say contrast 10 and see what happens. This probably won't do anything. Oh, whoa, that will definitely do something. <laughs> huh, I wonder if I can use this to get some reaction fusion worms. I think it might be blowing out the brightness far too much, but yeah, it's always fun to go in and try to uh, like make your give your functions some inappropriate values. <laughs> you can see the contrast is really just like clamping the brightest parts to the bright to white and the darkest parts to black, so it's really giving the, the saturation. Uh, a nice pedestal to like hue cycle in, and order of operations does make a difference. Pretty, I didn't actually test this out, but 90% positive. Get in there. Yeah, you can see this is not exactly the same as the, the other one. So the order of operations is going to make a large difference. This is sort of the fundamental uh, thing about nonlinear systems, and this is a nonlinear system right here, is that doing A, then B, then C is not going to take you to the same place as doing C, then B, then A. So, um, yeah, just like a heads up that when you're playing around with feedback, whether it's the internal feedback or this camera-based feedback, to shift up the order in which these things are done because uh, a lot of, this isn't like the most drastic difference like 
in, in between the two, but you'll notice uh, in other cases it will be a very, very drastic difference. Let's back things if we jack up here a bit. Oh yeah, we're going to get some rainbow barf, and sometimes when you hue cycle too much, you just lose, you lose your situation because it's just going too fast. So that's one of those edge of chaos type things. Um, edge of chaos is a term which refers to this sort of like balance in iterative systems where you can have like on one side of the system you have sort of like not much interesting happening and then over on the other side of the system you just have like what basically appears to be like random noise happening and then somewhere sort of right in the middle on the threshold where there's this area that kind of like goes back and forth between the two uh, you have the, the, the chaotic systems. Oh, thank you! <laughs> So, what is next? Let's turn the hue shifting down a little more subtly now. Uh, oh yeah, another fun thing I came up with earlier. Let's give saturate a giant number. Whoop. All right, now here's like a color scheme you're probably quite familiar with if you've ever played around with internal feedback on like video mixers. You've seen this clamped up green and magenta before. <laughs> And yeah, the interesting thing about, I think that this clamped out green and the clamped out magenta here are like essentially inverses of one another um, in a lot of like color spaces. But the really nifty thing I want y'all to focus on over here is check out these little like crazy line things that are popping up in around here. So saturation. When you saturate something, remember that Hydra is natively working in RGBA. That's red, green, blue, alpha, the, the pixel information. So doing things like saturation, um, saturation is a nonlinear map to and from RGB. So essentially just doing all of these things like contrast and saturate are applying nonlinear nope. <coughs> applying non-linearities to the color space while they're being processed. And as such, this is something I've noticed a lot in jacking up the saturation in these sort of digital zones where you're going from like HS, when you go from RGB to HSV or HSL and then back to RGB is you'll get these curly things happening. I'm pointing at the screen, which isn't helpful for you. Uh, <laughs> the mouse. Cursor is not very helpful either, but these sort of like tight little curly lines. Um, these are actually pretty common uh, behavioral patterns in reaction diffusion systems, uh, just as common as the little like wormy things that go back and forth. Uh, the actual name I think is Belisov. Uh, I'm not actually going to pretend like I remember the name off the hand. It is the name of two Russian scientists who studied a chemical reaction that uh, had this sort of same behavior of spiraling waves that come in and out. Uh, but somewhere in the, the conversion from RGB to HSL back to RGB, when in the saturation side of things lies apparently a very similar sort of situation because we get these crazy uh, spiral things happening. All right, so this is definitely, I'm not, Probably not going to get as far as I wanted to in this episode, uh, but that's okay. That'll just give me something to do next time. I'm getting pretty distracted by these sorts of things. What happens if I reduce contrast over here? And if I get some more of these spiral things happening. Oh yeah, so another pretty neat thing you can do, so see how I'm blending with the previous frame here? Um, you can blend a negative amount with your frames. So I'm going to blend negative 0.2 with this previous frame. And you might not notice immediately what it's doing. Let's turn this off. Let's turn some of these wildly things off for the moment. 
You can see we're getting pretty like spazzy and strobe here. Warning, there's going to be strobing happening. This is video feedback. Heads up. <laughs> And then I probably blend an extreme amount with the previous frame. I blend an extremely negative amount with the previous frame. We get this really kind of like crazy thing happening where it's sort of like barfing and strobing all sorts of crazy colors. Let me turn this one back on. And it's a pretty subtle thing that's happening right now. Uh, but it's definitely doing something. So this is something I play with a lot when I'm doing feedback things, is blend a slight amount negative with your previous frame, and then blend a positive amount with your previous frame. Uh, because this adds these sort of like, it's not quite like a sharpening algorithm, it's more like, it's not quite like differencing with your frame and then combining it with itself, but it's sort of similar. It's another one of those like crazy nonlinear things which really gives like, you can see how there's like the, 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 the colorful things happening at the edges of stuff here. That's pretty much what it's doing. And if we, another neat thing we can do when we have this is to displace this very slightly. So. Here, formatting. <laughs> so if I go over here and let me just scale this. See what happens. Another thing I didn't practice in advance. I had something prepared and then I got totally distracted by doing this. I guess. Don't put that there. there we go. And, whoa, ha 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 ha, here we go, reaction diffusion lines. So like I said, it's not exactly like sharpen, it's not exactly like differencing, but it works, the, 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 the general effect of things works very similarly. And I sort of had a hunch this would happen, but I didn't want to jinx it by saying so. But yeah. So, fun fact, everybody who was interested in trying to play around with uh, the really reaction diffusion and wormy feedback in Hydra, uh, here you go. You just blend negative and displace slightly. And voila. What happens if I turn this up? Probably more strobing. So that is, we're at 8.30 now, and I should probably move on to the next stage of things for a moment. Um, I'm going to have to run and use the bathroom for a moment. I'll just leave this up here like so. If you have any questions before I move on to the next stage of things, uh, just rack them up here and I'll answer them when I get back. So if we want to recreate that thing that I was doing before, um, I want to sort of explain what was going on over there. 
So what I was doing in the patch that we started out in was I was taking the same camera feed and I was luma keying it into an inverted version of itself. Um, the reason I was doing that is because um, think about how luma key works. Luma key is sort of a logic-based operation that says if brightness is near a certain threshold or above or below, I think it's just above, I think it's just below a certain threshold in this zone in Hydro, uh, but different kinds of Luma key operations will work differently. Um, but if the video input of this, the brightness, is below a certain threshold, we remove that and replace it with a different uh, video feed. Uh, exactly how Hydra does it is... Ooh, got some scrubbing going on. Scrubbing, buddy. is by using the alpha channel. So it just turns the alpha channel to zero if the brightness is at a certain threshold. Um, so we can do this. I think last time I was talking about different ways to do sort of like alpha masking things. I was using mask and composite. Uh, this time I'm going to use Luma. So Luma is an operation that just Luma keys things. Um, I think I was pretty confused about that one for a while because I saw it in the color zone and I thought it was like going to affect brightness somehow. And I kept using it and I was like, this doesn't affect the brightness. This just makes brightness disappear. And then I finally figured out it was Luma. <laughs> and then it makes sense. Um, there it is. I'm post sitting for someone right now, and the cat is about to step on the keyboard. You have to get down, buddy. You have to get down. Down, down, down. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, so I'm going to take this basic thing that I'm working with here, and then we're going to take the what what this whole chunk here, and we're going to luma key that into uh, an inverted version of that. So we'll start with layer, and then we're going to do a bunch of things within layer. So I'm going to try to do this all within one single draw. The reason I want it to be in one draw is sort of because when you're working with the camera-based feedback, it gets more confusing to mess around with the, uh, um, what do you call it, to work with the whole render buffer and different things, because you can match things up here, and then you do the render buffer, and it turns tiny over here. And you don't really see what's going on. So it's kind of important when you're doing the camera feedback stuff just to, like, keep the one thing up and going. And it's also important to try to, like, Ease up the strobing a bit. Oh yeah, so I've got to put something in here. Let's go SRC, S0, and Luma. How do we do this? Yeah. I'm going to do a Luma at the end, SRC, S0, invert, and then Luma, and let's go just Luma 0.5. All right, here we go. So you can see that we've got that same sort of like blobby thing that we had before, but it's like resting over this like seething turbulent ocean. And the ocean is being created by the um, basically this sort of uh, this chunk right in here, it's grabbing the same camera feed, it's inverting it, and then it's removing, it's alpha masking everything that's below 0.5. So this creates a really interesting tension between things. And if you try different values for that, we'll get sort of different, really different flavors of feedback. Try 0.95. We'll get some darker things happening. Heck yeah. Alright, so I'm going to go back up and saturate this one a little bit more. I'm going to saturate it after we've done this if inverted blending. I'm going to saturate it right at the end of the chain, but not too heavily. So I just want to 
want to do, yeah, sort of like this. It's a little bit too much. <laughs> and I need to reduce this Luma lower. Yes. All right. This is not actually what I expected to happen, but this is pretty crazy awesome. <laughs> Let's see what happens. And just to like show how non-linear this system is, I'm going to grab this saturate chunk here, just put it in different areas and see what happens. So we remove it, and that's what we get. Let's put the saturate right after the hue. And here's what we get. But here's originally what I was kind of thinking about, and my goal was, was to have just this sort of gentle saturation oil sheen thing going over things. Because uh, I really like, uh, you know, when you're biking around on a rainy day and you see that someone has like leaked oil or gasoline or some kind of shiny thing on the, the pavement and then it reflects in a really nice uh, um, layered iridescent sort of way. I really like that look. Um, but you know, it's not really, like, in, uh, environmentally responsible to, like, go through, like, um, basically, like, toxic uh, petroleum-based things on the ground during the rain just because it looks beautiful. Uh, so we should definitely try to figure out a better, more sustainable way to get that same look. Um, that's kind of a joke because laptops, LCDs, and USB cameras are also incredibly unsustainable. <laughs> environmentally unfriendly devices. Uh, not really much I have to say about that other than this is all sort of like <laughs> it's crazy luxuries. It's sort of absurd that we get to play around with these things as toys. Uh, it almost certainly won't last. Uh, so I guess, I don't know, <laughs> enjoy the things that you have while you have them. Uh, because, yeah, this is a very non-sustainable system. Here's another nice, very specific thing to like my life is I go canoeing in this one incredibly, I go canoeing in two of the most polluted canals in North America. Um, and one of them, there's just like a gas line underneath the canal that leaks regularly. Um, and then as you canoe over that gas line area, you can smell the gas everywhere and you can just see basically this kind of stuff, this like, layered oil sheen thing going over everything as you paddle through it, it like makes all these crazy vortexes and things. Um, there's actually a new form of life which has evolved um, in response to various other forms of pollution in there, as well as the... Oh, I didn't even saturate that over here. There go. Which lives in those layers of uh, gasoline on this incredibly polluted canal. They don't live anywhere else. Uh, they may be, I think they, they're like anaerobic bacteria, so <laughs> that's pretty wild. Go back down to this Luma zone, change this up a bit. Yeah. All right. Uh, there are fish. I see fish around quite a bit, and they, I don't do an eye count, but they seem to be reasonably okay with their situations. Uh, life is, some, like, life in general seems to be pretty, like, resilient in terms of, like, obnoxious pollution things that humans do, um, even though, like, a lot of what we do will kill off 90% of the diversity, some life does survive and somehow figure out ways to thrive in our trash. Um, and you know, sort of, that's, that's a little bit of my philosophy about working with art things is trying to find ways to thrive within the trash that I find on the street. Uh, I did not find this laptop on the street, but I found many, many, many computers on the street. <laughs> And then I turn them into laptops by taking them apart and putting them into these cases. Alright, so a couple other little nifty things I wanted to try with this specific setup. Let's turn down the saturation a little bit. And now that we have this pretty amazing crazy thing going on, uh, what was I doing earlier? Oh, crap, I need to 
write these things down. So if I go at the end of here, what happens if I do contrast at the end of this? Oh, that's what I was doing. So we were under shift, right? Um, well, I was goofing around with this mode. I was trying to think about just like, I wanted to like find ways to like modify the brightness of the, the background here. Yeah, free CRTs are all over the place. Although in New York, most of the time you got to get them before the copper vampires strip all the copper out of the backs of them. They just punch holes and grab all the copper out. So, what I did was I took shift, and then I think I just shifted things a little bit negative. So, negative 0.1, 0.1, I'm not going to do them all equally because, don't put that period there. This is not at all doing what it was doing before. It's pretty rad, though. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I had Luma set as high as it was before. The shift in this case is just doing some pretty, like, nice colorization under the feedback, which I'm 100% okay with. Maybe I need to turn this down. Yeah, so this is kind of what I was doing before where we get this sort of like ghost trails underneath the things. And maybe at this point we can start. So, so far what I've been doing is pretty similar to like how I play around with camera feedback mm -hmm. in general. Um, but mm -hmm. since we're working in Hydra, now is the time, I think, to very specifically do things that you wouldn't really be able to do with like a camera and screen setup. And the first thing that is really amazing you can do in Hydra is to modulate things. So I saw that there was a couple different values for which that Luma was pretty fun to play with. So I'm going to set up a modulator to modulate the Luma value. So we do that whole... Time, scale time correctly. For a second, sign. Do I put them on the parentheses? Yes, I do. And then, so I liked it when, so this point five, this is right here where I really enjoyed this. Um, and then I also really enjoyed the same thing that was not this, I really enjoyed when I had uh, Luma at 0.95. So let me pick a value in between there. Let's say 0.7. And then since math.sign is bipolar, it goes get up and then down and then up and then down. I'm going to say let's go, let's multiply this by 0.25. So then it'll go up to 0.95 and it'll come back down to about 0.5. Not quite, but pretty close. And I'm goofing something up in here. Ah, yes. That is incorrect. Yeah, so now I'm going to modulate the time. And that, or I'm going to, <laughs> going to modulate time. Uh, that would also be a nice tutorial as well. I modulate Luma, so that should be slowly shifting as this thing goes. And let's just kind of like stop and take a moment at this. And yes, this is pretty excellent. At 8.41, making great time. I'm not going to get back to that fish, the fish eye thing. But I'll sort of build up to it right at the end, and then next time I come back to this, which will be, let's see, one, two, three, I might be on vacation in three weeks from now, so it might be a month until I get back into Hydra Zones. But next time I come back, I will do that fishing eye thing. But this is, I think, pretty good build up to that whole kind of zone. 
Um, I can also modulate. So, notice a lot of these things I'm doing here are getting directly in the way of the feedback, which I'm also pretty okay with. Go here. Um, don't want to go that hard. So, let's try two and five. And of course, we don't. We want this to be at a different ratio because of cicadas. Whoa, there's some toxic, some toxic colors happening. Here is some feedback pollution going on. <laughs> That's a little too intense. But let's dial this down a tiny amount. One. Tiny bit more subtle. <laughs> you know me. I like subtle things. <laughs> I like I like the edge of subtle and uh, outright insane. I try to go from the edge of like tiny little subtle things and then like raving outright insanity. Um, okay, so this is a pretty great setup right here. Um, something might be slightly distracting to keep going with, but. I don't think I'm going to stop it, so, um, yeah. Next, let's talk about displacement. So, the, we can modulate all of this feedback using other uh, textures. So, let me, just for the sake of concision, I'm going to set up another texture over here. So let's have, let's say, noise out a one. Yep. So there's our noise. Maybe we'll make it a little more coarse. And is that the default? That's a fast. Yeah. Make sure we render O zero. And let's use noise. So we're working with two different, we're technically working with, so we're working with the same camera feed, but we're feeding back in and processing it in two very different ways. So we can modulate each one of those different processed camera feeds using a different texture and get some pretty crazy stuff. Um, I kind of would like to figure out how to remove these things. Honestly, I'm gonna pull these out for the moment. I like what they were doing but they're sort of right in the way of my feedback. So I'm gonna have to lose these. That's all right. right. Still doing some amazing things on its own. Oh wait, I need to have the Luma in there. There we go. Um, but let's use this noise over O1 to modulate some stuff about the first source. So the first source is this oily sheen that's on top. The second, or the, the, the same source, the first layer of the source right up here, source S0, hue, saturate, that's this top oily layer. So I'm gonna make it even oilier by saying let's modulate scale with a one and right off the bat we have got some oozing oil uh, yeah there is check the github page there's uh, I think on the main github page there's uh, information on using FFTs within Hydra So we've got this modulate scale going on here, and then I think we can dial this down a bit. We can go like 1.1 maybe, and we'll be a little more subtle. <laughs> you can see that 
the whiteness, the bright part of this noise, is modulating the scale of that one. That's pretty nifty right there. Let's turn off my phone for a moment. Alright. And then we can also move around the camera while we're doing this stuff as well. So you notice that we're sort of losing the reaction diffusion on these things while we're modulating. Maybe we need to modulate the scale somewhere else, but no, if we modulate the scale somewhere else, then we won't quite have the same thing going on. Um, but if we want to keep the reaction diffusion along those lines, remember the reaction diffusion, the little worms are coming from this section where we're doing source S0 within there. So if I just put the exact same line in there, then we should get, yeah, so we get the, in the, the, the sort of like differencing, like noise thing is going to get modulated as well along with the thing. We're actually losing some of the saturation that we have. Which, interesting. You know, you always learn something new when you experiment with this. Oh, we got the saturation back. <laughs> that looks pretty great. can try actually modulating this scale slightly differently. Let's modulate scale over 2. Let's maybe type this even 0, 5. Yeah, this is pretty bonkers. <laughs> Eight forty nine, meaning we're almost finished up with this zone. But let me show you what happens. We can take one more of these. Let's just grab like a simple oscillator with like two point five out O two. And then we can use that oscillator to modulate the back part of this, the, the, the black and white zones, the, 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 the inverted uh, channel. So down here we've got layer source as zero invert. Let's try modulate. Let's try to spell modulate correctly. And modulate O2. Let's just try modulate. <laughs> This one is always a little bit more... <laughs> yeah, we're getting this modulating throb happening over there. Um, I'm gonna maybe... Let's try modulate and rotate. Uh, that's nice. I can dial this one down a bit, right? Oops. Move my camera. You can modulate the camera as well with our elbows. Um, so this isn't exactly a program. This is a live coding language uh, that you can use in your browser called Hydra. So you can see, I'm not sure if I put it up so you can see the, the actual like browser that I'm working in. Uh, you go to, let me just write this down over here. If you go there and you, uh, it's probably a little bit too late to copy the code that I wrote here, but this will be up on uh, Twitch for a while. And after that. Um, you can use the, you can just copy this code, paste it in, and see that it'll do the same stuff. So this is a live coding language based in JavaScript uh, that uses ESGL to do uh, video synthesis, and it's pretty amazing. 
wonder how, when people watch these things on YouTube, I wonder how it seems when I answer the questions over in the chat because the chat doesn't come with, so if it just seems like, like I'm just like <laughs> going from talking to myself and talking to the screen to talking to the people in the chat. Um, but yeah, it's probably all good. Oh yeah, let me see if you just like point the camera at whatever. Hi, there's me. This is what it's doing. So if I do it this way, it's not really going to do the, the, because I'm not pointing at the screen, it's not going to do that interesting lumen key thing that was happening before. It's only when we get the screen involved that we get that tension between the inverted and non-inverted portion of things. But yeah, so since we're just about done here, I'm probably just going to kind of goof around with this exact thing for a minute. Um, and if you all have any more questions about things in general, about this, or about uh, if you have any suggestions for things I'm going to do in the future, uh, now is a great time to bring it up. Um, how to export this to Resolume? I just want to double check that's what you're asking. Um, I have not personally tried it because I do not use Resolume. Um, uh, the way that I would get this into any other program would be through um, Siphon is the easiest way to do it on OS X if you're on an older OS X but in general I'm recommending more and more people use NDI so NDI is uh, it does a lot more things than you would ever need to use it for like uh, screen sharing things but one thing that NDI does and let me type this out in here is you can use this as a frame sharing, a texture sharing, uh, uh, a way to share textures between programs. So basically you run Hydra over here and then you turn on NDI and you use NDI screen grab to grab the window output from Hydra and then uh, Resolume and pretty much all video programs nowadays, I'm 90% sure, have NDI as, uh, as an input. Um, this is also something I'm going to be putting into the Video Waves 2.5 uh, update is NDI as the default frame sharing I.O. as opposed to Siphon. Um, but yeah, I recommend everybody figure out NDI for using the various uh, graphics programs and uh, video synthesis and video processing programs to talk to one another. Uh, because it's, uh, it's the one that works across platforms and it doesn't seem to have the same like glitchy issues that Siphon has. Uh, but yeah, is that helpful? Oh, yeah, yeah. OBS is pretty easy, but once you get into OBS, then where else do you go? You can capture and you can go into a stream, but OBS doesn't really work. It's kind of only one direction. It grabs it in and you can composite things. Uh, but you can grab it into OBS and then composite with other things, and you can do like a window screen capture from NDI from that into Resolume. So that might be an interesting way to mix things around. The time formula? Um, so essentially what the time formula is doing, let me... So we're at 8.56 here. So um, it's going to be really hard to see things in the background here. So I'm going to remove this whole thing for a moment. Ah, that didn't quite work. So 
Well, say goodbye to everything here. <laughs> okay, so the time formula I had before. So, this is just generally like a shortcut for writing functions, and I think at some point I'll focus more on functions in the future, uh, but for now. Um, so what I did, I got these two parentheses here, I got the two curly brackets on the inside, and I put time in there. Time is a global function in variable, and what time means is it's the total number of elapsed seconds. It's probably like microseconds, actually. It's the total number of elapsed microseconds since you started playing around with this window. Um, but that number isn't necessarily so important as it's just a number that is just incrementing with every single frame. And uh, if I want to feed something into, so to feed it into something, I do the equal sign, I do this little arrow, and then the main thing I use this for is I do math.sign time. So math.sign means look over in the JavaScript math library for a function that's called sign. And that is just going to basically give me, since time is incrementing, it's changing with every single frame, it's going up. And the sign function, as you feed it something that increments, does movements like this. So it's just... Uh, pretty um, simple and easy way to get in um, some sort of modulation for something. So if I want to do some hue shifting here, malformed arrow function parameter list. Yeah, I wonder what I did wrong this time. It looks right, doesn't it? Probably missing... No. That's correct. Do, 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 do. As usual, I probably misspelled something. Oh, it doesn't have a problem with that one. It has a problem with this one. <laughs> so if I just feed it in there, then I will get some hue shifting. It will shift at uh, a constant up and down pattern because of the, that's how a sine function works. Does that make sense? take no response as a yes, that makes some amount of sense, or it makes the tiniest amount of sense. Okay, cool. Um, but yeah, you can write other functions like that. You can define functions up here outside of the source out thing. Um, I don't do a lot of defining functions myself because I like to change things too much, and I'm not really quite personally sure how I can define functions that have variables in. Uh, there's probably a way to do it, but I'm not sure about it yet. Uh, it's always helpful for me to remind folks during these tutorials that I don't actually know how to use Hydra that well. I just know how signals work and how to play around with things. And half the time when I'm doing this, I'm figuring out Hydra functions of Hydra for myself for the first time. So I like to mention that just to like remind folks that you don't need to understand a system in order to like have fun with it. Sometimes most of the fun you can have with the system is when you don't understand things because then you're experimenting and you're doing like unpredictable things. So it's nice just to like jump in over your head and just goof around with stuff and then figure out what it's actually doing afterwards. Um, but yeah, on that note, I think that is the end of this episode. Thank you very much for showing up and uh, have fun as always. And I'll see y'all next week where I will do something with uh, vSynth, 
Don't know what it's going to be yet, but I'm sure it'll be pretty nifty. All right. Oh, uh, bye. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>